All right, I've got a very nice Strat in the workshop today. It's a John Mayer signature model. These are quite expensive instruments, I believe. They came out in the early or mid 2000s, uh, and I think they ran for about 10 years. So I'm guessing this is at least 10, maybe up to 15 years old. It certainly looks like it's had plenty of playing. It belongs, it belongs to a, a professional musician who tours both nationally and a little bit internationally as well. The guitar seems pretty faithful to the old 60s strats, although, as I've said in past videos, I'm not a Fender historian, but we've got uh, vintage machine heads, we've got a, quite a small radius on the fretboard. It feels like a nine and a half. I'll, I'll measure it when I get the strings off. Got staggered pole pieces and the pickups, vintage style bridge. Weirdly, there's no cover on the springs uh, and there never was one. There's no screw holes in the finish, so yeah, it's new one on me, but the, the guitar is very well put together. The panel gaps, I like to call it, all the fit and finish, the way the neck heel fits into the neck pocket, I should say, the way the uh, parts fit inside the boundaries of the uh, pickguard, it's all very, very nice. It's in for a, a bit of a setup and some just kind of general maintenance and servicing. I've also been asked to check out the electrics because the middle pickup apparently is cutting out a bit. Um, I've also been asked to install my three-way rotary switch that I talked about in a previous video. It's my favorite strap wiring mod. Gives you a couple of series sounds. And then on top of that, when the guitar came in, luckily the owner was still here and I was able to point it out to him, there's actually a fine crack in the headstock. So, got a bit of work to do. Let's get into it. When someone says there's a particular pickup that's cutting out, I guess it could be several things with the wiring, but most likely it's the selector switch. And well, with this guy, I can't really fault it. I've been sort of going back uh, carefully between positions and also wiggling it side to side, and yeah, it seems to be fine. The pots are also seem to be fine, and the pickups as well, but I can't say the same thing. About the jack. Yeah, it clearly needs replacing, so I'll do that later on. As for the setup itself, well, the bridge thing's about right. It's about an eighth of an inch off the body. The nut slots, uh, some of them are a bit borderline. They're just a touch low on the base, but I think we can live with those. There's a bit of a buzz on the treble. <laughs> So there might be a high fret there or, or maybe a loose fret end that's that's popped up a bit so i'll have to have a look at that um the string heights yeah that's probably a touch low on the treble and just a hair too high on the base there's a lot of the grub screw on the top side of the saddles uh, which is a bit strange but none of them are bottoming out obviously when i dial in the neck those saddles will have to come up, so I think that'll be okay. I don't think we'll need to shim the neck. What I really want to do first, though, before I get stuck into this, the actual setup work and mod work, is to have a look at this crack. And I've just caught the top of the headstock in a reflection from my lights, and uh, there's actually sort of a dipped, uh, polished area just where the uh, top side of this crack emerges from the headstock. So I'm guessing that someone's already had a go at repairing it, so I might not ha actually have to do much at all. But um, I will have a look at it. I'll have to take the machine heads out though, of course, to do that, and I'm gonna have to take them out anyway, because the bushings are lifting ever so slightly, and on the low E string, the bushing's lifting quite a bit, probably because of that crack. So there's our crack, or cracks really, there's kind of three cracks here. This type of crack, well, it's not uncommon to be honest, and. It's because we've put a self-tapper very close to the edge of these holes and also quite close to the edge of the headstock itself. Um, I would like to think they drill a pilot hole, you know, in a, in a high-end guitar like this, and they probably did, but in a lot of instruments, they just jam the self-tapper straight down in. In the, in the factory, they'll have a, these, these main holes will be CNC, but then there'll be a template to hold 
the machine heads in place and then they just uh, drive the screw straight in. But what happens when you do that is that you're not really removing timber, you're just sort of forcing the wood fibers apart with the screw and it just means there's a little bit of sort of tension constantly either side of that screw in the wood fibers and it only takes a little bit of a knock for a fine crack to happen and then over time I guess due to, to all of the sort of tensions and forces on these machine heads, that crack just sort of spreads and, and kind of propagates till the edge, till it meets an edge. Uh, this would definitely be a weak point in the guitar. However, it's been repaired. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you can see, I'll try and get it in the shot, uh, but someone's actually repaired this and they've done a perfectly serviceable repair. It looks like they've just wicked super glue into these cracks and then let it cure leveled it and polished it. Um, for me, uh, I would probably have tried to open the crack ever so slightly, enough to get some thinned tight bond in. You can just put a drop of water in tight bond. And the only advantage of that really, this, this super glue will give you a perfectly reliable and serviceable repair. There's nothing wrong with this, except aesthetically. Super glue in light colored timber will almost always leave this black line. Um, for that matter, epoxies will do it as well, but, but uh, if, if the joint is, is close fitting and you can get some tight bond in, it doesn't tend to leave this line. So that's the only reason I'd try and get some tight bond in. Who knows, the original repairer may have tried to do that and just thought better of it. So I don't want to tread on any toes. Like I say, this repair is fine and I'm not going to touch it. Um, the only thing I'm nervous about is getting enough tension on, or, or, or torque, I guess, onto these screws that go into the cracks. So um, I didn't actually try tightening them off, I only just loosened them off. So I might actually put the machine head back in first, try and see if I can tighten them down properly, and if not, then I'm going to have to drill out these and fill them. Yeah, they're fine. I can get them down nice and tight. I think I'll leave the repair just as it is. As I mentioned, all of these bushings are lifting and it's pretty common with vintage style tuners of all types, um, not just strats, but um, bass guitars and stuff as well. In fact, I've already got a video about pressing these down and gluing them in place when they're really, really loose. Uh, in that video, I think I used tight bond. These just need a drop of CA in the backs. And I've even seen uh, from brand new factory instruments where some manufacturers are doing that. Uh, this low E string though is pretty loose. I've just got a long series socket and yeah, it's it's kind of, it's borderline, but, I'm, but I think I'll just use CA for it. I think it's gonna be okay. It is, it still does press in. Um, if there was no friction on it at all for, for its travel light, then I would definitely use a thicker glue like Type Bond just to fill that void, but I think we'll be okay with a few drops of CA. There's lots of ways you can press these down. Um, this E string one I can almost get down fully with my fingers. If the neck wasn't on the guitar, I could even put this into a vise if I put soft face jaws in and just gently close them. Uh, but in this situation, I'm gonna use a little jig, which is uh, two wing nuts and a bolt. Now, as far as I know, washers are punched out of a flat sheet. So as such, if you look at them closely, you'll see that they've got a soft edge on one side and then a slightly burred edge on the other side. And this probably goes without saying, but you want to make sure the soft edge is on the lacquer side. You could, of course, just tap these home with a soft face mallet, I guess. But the nice thing about pressing them down this way, especially if you're working on a very old vintage instrument where the bushings have possibly not been up for a long time and the holes might have ovaled slightly, well, by pressing them down this way, you know that they're going to be in pretty good alignment with the string posts on the machine heads. So I've just got a little pool of medium viscosity CA glue and I'm just going to blunt off a toothpick. You don't want to use thin CA for this job because there's a chance it'll run right through and uh, actually mar up the finish on the front side. But provided the flange on the top side of the bushing is a nice fit to the face, medium CA won't do that. 
Um, and the idea is to do, I'm going to do three drops each one. I'm going to put two drops on the back end, probably just uh, there and there. And then a third one on the front end just for sort of good measure. I'm just touching the timber first and then just letting the little blob run down behind the bushing. I'm also not using any accelerator on this, uh, partly because I hate using accelerator around finish, and I reckon this may well be nitrocellulose, being a, a you know a vintage replica type instrument. And also, I don't want to actually set this glue up very quickly. I want it to run down into the knurlings around those bushings. So while that CA glue is setting up, there's a couple of things to say. I have removed the jack and I've taken the screws out of the pick guard. I've taped up the pickups. I do still actually enjoy and kind of prefer to use steel wool when I'm fret polishing. I know that people uh, on the internet go crazy about that, but if you tape up your pickups, it's perfectly fine. Plus, when I'm not filming, I normally do fret dressing at a completely different bench. This is my electronics bench typically, um, and it's never a problem, but steel wool is very effective at polishing frets, and it's very cheap and works really well, so I continue to use it. The other thing I will say is that uh, a little top tip here is when you go to remove your pick guard on a strap, say, you want to leave your switch tip and the pot knobs on as well, because until you get it free, uh, if those metal parts are exposed, there's a chance that you'll rest it on something or you'll catch it on something and you'll actually scratch the finish. So I am going to get on and mod this guy. Well, I assume this aluminium layer is factory. It's all sort of scratched up. It's got fine scratches on it for some reason. I don't know why they would do that. Um, the interesting thing though is that this pick guard I thought at first was a very nice replica of the old celluloid guards. Uh, turns out it actually is celluloid and I know that from um, from two things. Firstly that the holes don't line up anymore so the guard is actually shrinking slightly. Um, and secondly, when I just very gently uh, reamed that hole so I could get the pot back in, um, you can smell, if you smell it, let me put it up to the camera and, and have a sniff. There you go. It smells like kind of Dettol or something, like a disinfectant smell. So yeah, this guard is actually real celluloid. I guess they found some new old stock. I didn't even know people actually still made celluloid. I didn't think you could even get it as a material anymore. But there you go. I'm going to have to get this done quickly and get it back on the guitar because this will shrink and it might not line up even after a few hours. So with a three layer pick guard you just have to be very careful when you're drilling a hole for this anti-rotation lug and the switch. Make sure you stop at the black because <laughs> the last thing you want to do is go through the white and then the, tur the tortoise shell. All right, I've just test fitted that switch and even with the shape proof washer underneath it, it was just sort of sitting a bit high in that lug and I don't really want to risk drilling this any deeper. So all I did was just round over the shoulders of the lug itself like that, but that will just make it sit into that chamfered hole a little bit better. It's all wired up and ready to test. As I mentioned in the original video for this mod, well, it's a pretty fiddly thing to wire, especially the first version, which is what I've done here. You can see that there's a very, uh, very crowded wiring on this rotary switch. It's a three-way 
four pole rotary switch and it's even more fiddly to do when the wires from the pickups are these old school sort of cloth braided wires a lot of these wires actually have to have a secondary wire going into the same lug on the switch uh, like uh, like here for example and here and here so if you if you take your guitar to a tech and ask them to wire something like this you want to make sure you're kind of on good terms with that tech, I guess. It really is quite fiddly to wire. You need to find a tech that actually enjoys doing this sort of wiring. If you haven't seen that video, the mod, by the way, is a three-way rotary switch. When it's in the middle, we just have standard five-way strap switch operation uh, with a master volume and a master tone. But when you roll it forward, these two pickups are hardwired in series to that volume control. And when you roll it back, the bridge and metal pickups are wired in series. So you get two series humbucking sounds uh, that you can just switch straight to. I think it's pretty cool. By the way, this switch knob is just for testing. I actually do have an ivory one coming in the post. Okay, that new jack's all wired up and ready to go. And I really want to get this pickguard back down onto the guitar. As I mentioned, it tends to shrink and, and change shape unless you keep it sort of nailed down. If you do have to take a celluloid guard, guard off a guitar for any extended period of time, like, I don't know, maybe you're doing reef in work or whatever, you want to screw it down to a nice flat piece of plywood or something like that. But a few hours is fine. Even overnight, you'd probably get away with it, but uh, I wouldn't push it. So I've just noticed that a couple of these pick guard screws have a little bit of rust on the threads. And if I just put that straight back in, well, over time that rust will get worse and eventually it'll kind of bond with the wood fibers and screws like that can be very difficult to remove. So do the next tech a bit of a favor and do something about it. And what I normally do is just put a little tiny dab of lanolin grease. This is a byproduct of the wool industry. It smells like a shearing shed. It's quite lovely actually. Um, and it really, you just need a tiny amount on the threads. Uh, that's really all it takes. It's quite sticky and weird stuff, but that will actually uh, go some way to treating that rust. It also acts as a, a lubricant as well, I guess. If you just use regular black grease, the problem is that that uh, oil in the grease can actually run into the wood fibers and spread under the lacquer. And especially on light colored timbers, it can actually make it look pretty crappy. So I've never had that issue with lanolin grease. With these vintage style machine heads, in the past, I've tried to get grease into those holes with a syringe, kind of like a mini grease gun, I guess, but it doesn't really work. So these days, I just I just try and push a bit in with the tip of my finger. Modern tuners, of course, are sealed for life, so I don't know if this is really necessary, but it kind of feels right to do it. So I just go ahead and do it and wind it in. <laughs> you can always tell a high-end fender when there's no shim and the heel is a very nice fit in the neck pocket. June 06 build date. As usual I just put a tiny smear of grease on the string posts right where they rub on those bushings. It's amazing how many guitars I work on with marred or stripped out Phillips heads. Even on the lowest clutch setting, a typical drill driver will have way too much torque for those little pickguard screws or little machine head screws like these. So usually I put them back in by hand and actually for a set like this, you want to leave them all a bit loose until they're all in and everything's lined up. Then you can go back and firm them up. nine and a half inch radius. You can only adjust this truss rod of course by removing the neck so as a reference point I'll just mark where it's at. I did measure the relief when the strings were on and up to pitch before and it was just a little bit over. It was about 16 thou I think. I'll aim for somewhere around 8 thou in the final setup. You can see with the strings off and the truss rod still tight the neck is more or less flat. There's a tiniest bit of relief there. With the neck off, I'll take this opportunity to remove the truss rod completely and lubricate it. I use multi-purpose grease on the threads and just on that leading edge. Recessed nuts like this will often rub the timber surrounding them with a surprising amount of friction. So that's just a bit of Goss dry lube on the outer surface. 
So now I'll wind that truss rod back to the mark and I know the board's more or less flat for any little fretwork jobs I have to do. And then before I reassemble the guitar, I can give the truss rod nut maybe a, a sixth of a turn or something like that. And hopefully with strings on, I'll be pretty close or certainly in the ballpark of the correct relief. I haven't been asked to do a full fret dress on this instrument and it doesn't need it. But I will uh, do some fret rocking on that treble side, see if I can find out why it was buzzing a little bit. And there's a high one right there, the sixth fret. So I'll go on and test the whole board with these little straight edges. I made these many years ago just by cutting up a steel ruler. These days, of course, you can just buy a tool called a fret rocker. Along with the sixth, there was two or three more that were slightly high on that treble side, so I'll write them down. So there's a dead weight under the neck, and I can tap those slightly high frets down with a fretting hammer and check the board again with my straight edges. Those three or four frets all tap down nice and tight to the board. I didn't detect any looseness or loose fret ends or anything like that. There's no real reason to try and float CA glue under them or anything. I doubt you'd probably get any glue under them anyway because they are so tight. And, and you'd expect that with a high-end guitar like this. Here I'm using white spirit to clean the board. It's also known as dry cleaning fluid or naphtha. And I like to wrap the rag around my thumb like that so I can really get in close around the frets. As we discovered, this guitar is about 17 years old and it's not uncommon to get this problem. It's called fret sprout. It was only very subtle. It's where the rosewood foot board has shrunk ever so slightly laterally and it means the fret ends are poking out slightly. It just makes it a little bit rough to play on sometimes. So I'm just going to kiss those fret ends with my fret file. Next step is to just remove those filing marks with some 400 grit paper taped to a block. The final step in the fret sprout fix is to deburr all those fret ends and that's the file I use. That's one that I prepared many, many years ago. It's a four-sided file as you can see and I've just ground two opposing faces flat. That way, when you're using it this way, it's not actually going to remove any timber. And you can see I'm doing all of the burrs in one direction on one side first, and then I'll come back in the other direction for that side, and then I'll flip the neck and do those two processes again. Doing them this way keeps your hand at the same angle along the whole run there, and it just makes for more consistent looking fretwork. I'm also really barely removing any material here. I'm really just letting the file glide over those burrs until I don't catch your skin. I really don't want to round over the fret ends here. I much prefer the cleaner look of squared off fret ends. And even if you are into really rounded over fret ends or, or hot dog fret ends, I really don't think that would look right on a vintage replica instrument like this anyway. See, here's one of my favorite fret polishing tricks. I've been doing this for many years and it works really well. That's the wide side of my fret crowning file and I've just wrapped it with 400 grit paper. And the first few strokes, you're just pushing the paper into the groove and then it really only takes two or three strokes of 400. I'm really not removing any material here or very little. It's certainly not affecting the fret heights. This really is just a polishing step. If I had done a full fret dress and I had also gone ahead and recrowned all of these frets, then I'd have to spend quite a bit more time on each fret with the 400 grit this way. And in that situation, I'd shuffle to fresh paper probably every second or third fret. But if I'm working on frets that are in otherwise good condition and I'm really just polishing them like I am here, I'll get five or six or seven frets out of the paper before I have to shuffle it along. I should say here that if this was a lacquered maple board, then I would have spent the time masking the whole thing up. And to be honest, if you're new to this, I'd recommend masking all boards up until you get a feel for it. With rosewood, it's much less critical because if you slip with some 400 grit, it barely scuffs the surface, which can be removed very easily. Obviously in lacquer, you'd have to polish it out. In my experience, 400 grit is, you know, coarse enough 
to efficiently remove tarnishing and minor scuffs and marks on the frets, but it's fine enough so that you can go straight to this stuff, the dreaded 4.0 steel wool. Notice I've extended the wings on my fret guard with some masking tape, and you can see it really just takes four or five strokes on each fret to bring them to a polish. On my own instruments, that's usually where I call it a day, but when I'm working on someone else's guitar, I think it's nice to deliver that guitar with a nice mirror polish. So I use my Dremel with the remote handpiece, a little bit of buffing chalk there. Honestly, I'm barely touching those frets and I'm keeping the wheel moving. It's on a sort of 25 degree angle. Plus, of course, I've got non-slip matting on my bench, so I've got good control here. This really is the third part of a process, if you know what I mean. If I tried to short track here by, say, skipping the steel wool and just trying to get the scratches from the 400 grid out with the buffing wheel, well, I'd end up spending so much time on the wheel that it'd take more time overall. Plus, I'd end up putting a lot of heat into the fret and you run the risk of loosening any glue under the fret or, or, or melting bindings around the fretboard or ending up with a huge buildup of buffing chalk either side of the frets, which you'd just have to go back and clean off anyway. I'm not sure the camera really captures it very well, but these frets really are like a mirror. And you might also be able to see that the board is pretty dry in places, so I'm going to give it some oil. This is Feast Watson Orange Oil. I've used this on boards for many, many years. You can just buy this at the hardware store in my part of the world. I like it because it's silicon free, which really is a must for any sort of product you're using around guitars. And also because it's food grade, which I think is a nice bonus with a product that you're putting on something like a fretboard that's constantly being touched by the player. Being food grade though means that they obviously can't put solvents and oxidizing agents and everything in this sort of product. So it does take a while to dry. Plus it means you can't really use it as a cleaner first as well as an oil, like a traditional lemon oil that you buy, you know, the Dunlop guitar oil sort of stuff. But that's fine with me. I'm happy to use a separate solvent as a cleaning agent first. On a board like this that does have some quite dry areas, I'll apply it really quite wet and then leave it 10, 20 minutes and just wipe the excess off. And you can see the board still looks quite wet and sort of slightly greasy. But if I leave that for an hour or so, I might go and get lunch or do something else in the workshop and then it will be dry enough to move on. I might give it one more quick rub over with a soft cloth and then I can get on with the rest of the setup. And you can see once it's dry, it has that nice dark matte look. So there's a couple of interesting features on this particular headstock. The first is that there's only one string tree or string retainer. So that means that the D and the G strings uh, aren't otherwise held down, but they're the furthest machine heads from the nut itself. So ideally, when the strings are wrapped on these posts, I want them emerging from the post quite low. I don't want them so low that they're going to foul on the bushing or get jammed on the bushing, but I want them to come out of this pretty low, and that's so I can get good break angle over the nut. The other thing is that these particular machine heads, you can probably see, actually have a slot in the top. You can certainly treat these as if they had a hole and just lay your string in there, uh, wrap it back on itself to a luthier's knot, tighten it up and then cut the excess off. That would work fine. But I actually prefer to use this type of machine head a bit like a bass guitar machine head where the string actually goes down the middle and then uh, is kinked and, and is wrapped that way. It, in my experience, it just, it, it just gives a firmer hold on the string, slightly more reliable tuning, especially when you've got a tremolo bridge and all the rest of it. So the first thing I want to do is actually work out how deep this hole is. So I've got an offcut of string, I'm just going to poke it in and, and bend it and that'll give me an idea right there. The thing about guitar strings, um, especially bass strings, but guitar strings as well, and that is normally if you did just uh, put this through a hole, wrap it round, tighten it up, then it's all set before you cut the excess off. 
Whereas if you do this like a bass guitar, you really have to cut the excess off first. And it's a really good idea. In fact, it's kind of best practice, I think, to work out where that kink is actually gonna be and put it in the string first before you cut the string. Some strings, uh, you can actually damage the string if you cut them before you get a kink or two into the string. The, the wraps can actually loosen off. I'm not entirely sure that these particular Daddario's I've got are gonna be like that, but I just think it's a good habit to get into if you do have to cut the string before you install it. So what I like to do is actually just get a rough idea of the diameter of the post. In this case, they're five mil, give or take. They're actually fluted, so that diameter does change slightly. So what that means is that a wrap of string is gonna consume something like 15, maybe 16 millimeters of string. You can see here with the A string, I've got three wraps and it's fairly low. So with this string, if I want it fairly even lower, because it's a skinnier string, I'm gonna go for something like four or even five wraps of string um, on the post. So that means I'm gonna be using something like 70, 75 millimeters of excess string. So I'm actually gonna measure it, believe it or not. And then I'm gonna kink it right there. Put a nice hard kink in it. Uh, then I'll use my little off cut of string like that to give me an idea of where to cut it. It doesn't have to be the same length, just as long as it's relatively sim similar. I'll cut that guy like that. So now I can put that in, give it a good kink round and start going clockwise. There's three wraps right there. Uh, and let me wind the rest of it on. And there's about four and a half wraps right there. So I'm pretty happy with that. We've got pretty good break angle. With the G, I want it even lower if possible. And being such a skinny string, I think I'm gonna go for about eight wraps, which is about 130 millimeters, I guess, um, of excess string. So there we go. Uh, slightly off camera, but that's our 130 mil there. So I'm gonna kink that uh, and cut that end to length. And we'll just get that started first. Three, four, five. Well, I know it looks a little bit weird and it does seem a little bit excessive, but now I've got good break angle over the nut. So I can go ahead and do the other treble strings. There's no reason to really go crazy with them. With the string tree here, I'll aim for probably four, four wraps each, something like that. So I did end up tweaking the nut slots just a little bit. The G was a touch too high and all the others, I wanted to make sure that the angle of the nut slot was just right. Ideally, it's around about the same or just a touch shallower than the approach angle of the string from the machine head. In my experience, filing them that way just seems to give those open strings a nice clean, clear, sustain and, and ringing tone. And obviously making sure those slots are the right width and shape will help give you good tuning stability as well. So with the strings up to pitch, I can check the relief again. And even with my extra little tweak of the truss rod from before, the relief was still just a touch high. I measured something like 12 thou and there's plenty of adjustment left in the truss rod. So I'll take the neck off and give it another tweak. Top tip, I'm using the capo to hold the slack strings in place for when I remove the neck bolts. There's no reason to remove the neck completely. You can leave the rear screws in but loose and that usually gives you enough space to adjust the truss rod. Notice I'm using a flat blade screwdriver here. 
I'm not entirely sure of all of the geometry and physics of it, but they definitely seem to grip the vintage cross-headed truss rod nuts better than a Phillips head screwdriver, which to me is counterintuitive, but they, yeah, they definitely seem to work better. So I'll retune and check the relief again. I'm also giving the strings a little pull to keep them in tune. They are new after all. Notice I'm also doing this in the playing position, which is really important, especially when you get really close to that final setup. And that's because the weight of that headstock will change the relief ever so slightly, depending on whether the guitar is laying flat or on its side. So that's eight thou now, and for a guitar with a relatively small radius on the fretboard, that's kind of on the low side, or it's on the low side of acceptable, but you have to remember that this neck had double that relief originally, plus it needed some truss rod tension just to keep the neck flat when there were no strings on it. So there's every chance that over the next day or two, the neck will actually settle back ever so slightly and end up at nine or 10 thou, which is really ideal. So with all the fretwork done and the nut slots correct and the relief all dialed in, it's time to adjust the final string heights. And if you have to raise the saddle like I am here, well, the trick is to slacken the string off before you do that. That way the, those grub screws aren't working so hard against the weight or the tension of that string. Now, as I've said in other videos, even straight ahead bread and butter setup work rarely goes fully to script and adjusting these grub screws, well, that's where I hit a snag. Well, this has stopped me in my tracks. This is the saddle from the A-string. I did notice before that it had a slightly shiny looking grub screw on it, but I've just gone to adjust this height uh, for the final setup. And I've actually noticed that this grub screw has been bashed on top by something and it's actually bent it. So it's actually pointing out that way ever so slightly. I'm not sure if you can tell. So I'm going to have to get this out. Hopefully the threads in the saddle itself aren't damaged because I doubt very much that I've got a, a tap to match this. And to be honest, I doubt very much I've got a replacement grub screw on hand. This will be an Imperial like 40 TPI grub screw. So I think I'll see if I can ease this out. And uh, I might actually have to order some grub screws online. So I looked through all of my bits and pieces, and I also looked through all my junk boxes with uh, old dusty old bridges and guitar parts and stuff, but I couldn't find anything that had quite the right threads. These vintage style saddles in fenders use a what's known as a 440 threaded grub screw or 4-40. I think the first four refers to the diameter. Yeah, it's a UNC numbering system and then 40 I think stands for 40 threads per inch. But don't quote me on any of that. I did find some on eBay but they were likely to take a week in the post. And uh, you can of course buy packets of them uh, as a genuine fender part, but the dealers I phoned locally said that was likely to take two weeks. <laughs> so I phoned some of the bolt and fastener specialists and I did find a place locally that could supply a whole box of them, but what on earth am I gonna do with 99 spare 440 by 38 scrub screws? Plus those guys would have had to order them in especially anyway. You have to remember Australia is very much a metric country. So in the end, I actually uh, phoned around some of the local guitar techs and in, the, in some of the smaller guitar shops around the place. And as luck would have it, I found a bloke just a couple of suburbs away. Uh, and when I went down there, he spent a good amount of time going through all of his dusty old bits and pieces like I had. And he actually found a grub screw that was the right thread. It was a touch too long, it was actually a half inch grub screw, but they're easy enough to shorten. You just have to be very careful uh, to protect the threads if you're gonna put it in a vise or something while you file it down. And he refused to take any money, not just for the grub screw, but for his time, of course, as well. So I wanna give a big shout out to Chris at Guitars Plus down in Sandringham. He really helped me out. If you are in Melbourne around Bayside, check out the store. It's an old school mum and pop guitar store. <laughs> Now that I've got this back together, I'm going to put it back in the guitar, of course, and get on, finish the setup. But I've just thought of another service point that I really should get to. 
So before I return this guy to the tail piece and get on with the setup, I want to lubricate all of these six pivot points for the tremolo bridge so I've got the strings completely slack. Uh, I think the first thing I'm going to do is just wind these two saddles back. I'll have to adjust their intonation anyway, uh, and I'll just get them out of the way. I think I'll also give these a bit of a clean around where the screws are. Next step is to slacken off the tremolo springs. The bridge was in just about the right spot with string tension, so before I slacken them off, I'm actually going to measure where the claw is in relation to the end of the route. It's about 13 millimeters. That way I can return it and be, if not perfect, but pretty close when I get back to do the final setup. I'm not removing these all together, I'm just slackening them off. Now, since there is still some spring tension on the bridge, I'm gonna do these two at a time. I'm gonna unscrew them. They don't have to come right out though. I'll give them a bit of clean up under their heads. Just gonna use a little tiny bit of general purpose grease under each one. Like so. And they can go back down. Make sure the tailpiece is down and I'll take that screw down till it's just kissing the top of the tailpiece. Then I'll clean up any squeezed out grease. Then I'll back these off by half a turn. And I can move on and do the other four the same way. So now we're all back together. The first thing I've got to do is just get this really accurately up to pitch. And really no matter what guitar you're working on or bass, it has to be kept at pitch through the whole process of setup. First thing I'm going to do is just check that bridge height or the, the tailpiece height from those springs and it's actually just a touch low so I'm actually going to slacken off those springs by a turn or two. And of course now the whole instrument will be out of tune, so I've got to tune up again. So we have to keep it in tune through the setup process. Uh, even without a sprung bridge, it's important because that sets the tension on the neck, which of course sets the relief, and we're setting the string heights and the intonation and everything in relation to the relief. They're all sort of uh, interactive. But with a sprung bridge, of course, every time you shift one string, the whole instrument goes out of tune, so you have to re-tune constantly. I don't have a whammy bar that suits this. There's nothing in the case, but... Um but it seems to be holding its pitch pretty well. Strats are never perfect, but uh, this one seems to be okay. So the next step now is to set the individual string heights via these elusive saddle grub screws. You can really only do this once the relief is correct and the height at the nut slots is correct. I always measure it at the 10th fret. Um, most people do it at the 12th fret. It's just a habit I picked up when I was working in the setup room at Mayton. We always did it at the 10th fret, I don't know why. And what I'm going for here is a pretty much a standard sort of setup. I'm going for, or maybe just a touch higher than standard. Uh, I'm going for about a millimeter and a half on the treble E and across to the bass E. I wanted probably 1.75. And then I just want an even action across that 10th fret 
just ever so slightly going a touch higher on each string. So the B is too low, the G is still too low, the D is about right and the A is too low. So I've got three strings to raise and as I mentioned uh, before I think I want to slacken the strings off that way the grub screws uh, aren't working against the tension or the weight of that string. And I'll turn these probably half a turn each. Also keep an eye on how the saddles are lined up and that they have an even height from one side to the other. And once again I have to retune. Setting up a guitar with a sprung bridge can really be a bit tedious with all of this constant tuning. That looks okay, the treble E is just a touch high. I'll get that back that off by a quarter turn. And that B string, I overdid it, I'm gonna back that off by a quarter turn as well. And yep, retune. So, I'm happy with those string heights. Well, it seems to be playing pretty cleanly, so I'm happy with that. It definitely, the, the treble E string seems to have improved with those uh, minor fret adjustments. So I'm happy with that. I just want to go through now as a final check and have a look at the intonation. So I'm going to get the octave harmonic in tune and then compare that to the fret and maybe work my way up the fretboard as well just to get a feel for it. Being very careful to fret the strings as cleanly as possible just go straight down because it's very easy to bend them out of tune especially when you're really a bass player. <laughs> So that's actually a tiny little bit sharp there, which means I have to increase the distance that the string is traveling. So I actually have to shorten this uh, adjustment screw. And again, I'm going to slacken the string off to do that. Just so the grubs, so the adjustment screw is not actually working so hard against the tension of that string. I'll draw that back. And just check the overall tuning as usual. And that seems to have improved that situation, so I'll go ahead and do the rest of the strings. So the intonation's all set up. There's only one more little adjustment that I can do, and that is the pickup height. So I'm just going to get rid of this. Masking tape. Just try and get a sense of string to string response and try and just get it even. I generally start with the bridge pickup as uh, fairly close to the strings. Sounds like a little bit bass heavy to me, so I'm actually going to raise the treble side. That's not too bad. Sounds a bit weak, that middle pickup. I'm going to raise it slightly. Compare it to the bridge pickup, 
And let me hear the neck pickup. Again, sounds a bit weak. I'm going to raise that a touch as well. And of course, my series sounds. That's the neck and middle in series, and now the bridge and middle in series. Much hotter output, of course, a little bit more mid range. Well, it's a new day in the Mod Cave. It's actually two or three days since I did most of the work on this guitar. When you make a significant adjustment to a truss rod and uh, set up a guitar, it's, well, if you have the option, it's always nice if you can hang on to an instrument for a day or two. And that's because sometimes it takes a few days for the neck to just settle down. More often than not, the neck will actually spring back ever so slightly. Sometimes it'll even uh, continue to move and end up being flatter than when you left it. Luckily with this guitar, it's pretty much exactly where I left it. So I know I've got a good and stable neck. This chicken head knob arrived in the mail. It's called ivory, but it's kind of too dark and I ended up not using it. It just didn't look right. So I went back to the white one that I originally had and then colored it slightly with a little bit of yellow shellac. That's not the sort of thing you normally do in setup, so I made a separate video about that and posted it the other day as, as one of my quick tech videos, so check it out if you're interested in that. The other thing I did just today actually was, well, I dropped the action slightly. I know the neck's nice and stable, so I think it, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to make it easier to play because it was playing so cleanly. So now on the bass side, it's one and a half millimeters and then it tapers slightly on down to the treble side which is just under one and a half millimeters. You do have to be careful when you drop the action on a, on a guitar though, especially a Strat, um, because check this out, if I play on the bass strings uh, further up the neck, hopefully you can hear that sort of warbling kind of chorus, chorus sound. What's happening here is what's, well, at least I think what's happening here is what's known as string pull. It's so common in strats that it's often called strat-itis. And it happens when the strings are just a little bit closer to the, too close to the magnets in the pickups. I think the other day I raised uh, one or two of the pickups slightly just when I was regulating their outputs uh, between each other and string to string. And now that I've actually dropped the strings ever so slightly, I think that's what's going on. Obviously, the closer to a magnet you are, the stronger the field is. And there's a point where the strings' natural modes of vibration are affected by the magnet. And so that's... That's what you get, that funny chorusy sound. And I can tell you now, if you have it uh, in your guitar, you'll never be able to set the intonation properly. Your... Um, the tuner will be dancing all over the place. And even if you do get it accurate, well, when you go to play a chord, because one of the strings or two of the strings are wobbling like that, even if it is in tune, it'll just sound out of tune. The thing is though, sometimes these sort of sounds are caused by other things. Uh, it could be that the string is not sort of seated in the bridge properly. It could be just a bad string. Um, sometimes it happens with, uh, well, it often happens with cheap strings and fake strings. Uh, it could be that the string's been damaged, as I mentioned in the video earlier. If you cut a string before it's kinked, uh, the wraps can sort of unlock from the core of the string and that can cause all sorts of weird <laughs> weird sounds. So before I go just dropping these pickups and possibly chasing my tail with some other weird uh, string problem or a weird acoustic resonance, I want to be doubly sure that it really is the magnets that's causing the problem and there's a really simple trick you can do. I'll show you. So there's our wobbly sort of chorusy sound. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a couple of these straight edges that I use for uh, fret rocking. Uh, but really you could use just about anything steel or anything metal that's, that's attracted to magnets. In other words, ferromagnetic and anything that's skinny enough to fit under the strings. And I'm just going to place them on the magnets on the base side. 
like that. And I'll turn the volume back up again and try it again. And you can hear a, a great reduction in that wobbling sort of sound. In fact, I think it's, I think the strings sound like they're just ringing true. So what's happening here is the steel in these uh, sort of pieces of metal, well, it's kind of absorbing, I guess, to a certain extent, part of that magnetic field, but it's really distorting the field and kind of diverting it away from the strings. And so now they're not being affected as strongly by those magnets and, and they're ringing true. And it's also, of course, why the output of the pickups is a little bit lower as well. So now I know I can be sure that it really is just the magnets and not some of the other weirdness going on. And I can go ahead and, and, and readjust the pickups just as I did earlier in the video. I won't bother filming it, but clearly I need to lower them and then adjust their heights uh, to regulate them so they have a nice even output across the strings and also between the pickups. So there you go, keep an eye out for, well, I guess an ear out for string pull when you're adjusting the pickups on your guitar, especially if it is a Strat. Now, I've already started editing this video and I've just decided to leave everything in. I've actually had a few requests to do a full setup video. Uh, having said that, honestly, if you're new to all of this, uh, you can't really expect to learn everything you need to know about setting up guitars from one video <laughs> or even 10 YouTube videos. But hopefully it's giving you a bit of confidence uh, and you can go out and get yourself a cheap Strat or, or something on Marketplace and just have a go. This guitar though is all finished now and it's, it's sounding and playing really great. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe and also hit the bell icon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.